Before we begin uh, calling witnesses, I overheard an exchange between the council that uh, I wanted to comment on. I heard you say, Mr. Bright and Mr. Walsh, that uh, Walsh about a, he can have rebuttal to your rebuttal. And uh, I want to say, in my view, that, and you put me probably thinking of 128 Two feet in the uh, procedure that that session uh, uh, suggests. Um, here's my ruling about it. Uh, I think it's a denial do not due process if a person with the ultimate burden of persuasion cannot respond to new information brought up by respondents in this portion of the case. Since they have the ultimate burden for them not to be able to respond to something that's new, it would be a denial of due process. Uh, what that means is, and you can govern yourself accordingly, I'm going to use my discretion as the trier of fact uh, to allow some survey button <coughs> that goes to new matters brought before the court in your portion of the case, this portion of the case. However, if you don't go into new matters, if what you do is explain what's in the application and use that to counter what you've heard from petitioners, we don't get into that area. There's no reason to rebut that. You know, that, that was in. It's been brought to my attention through your witnesses and explained. Uh, that doesn't present uh, new support for uh, to demonstrate reasonable assurances. But if you bring something forward that constitutes new support, not in the record yet, in this portion of your case, I will allow some sort of rebuttal to go to that. Your Honor, after uh, further consultation with co-counsel and with counsel for DEP, we were not planning to make a blanket objection to any sort of rebuttal. We will reserve that to uh, see what actually is presented under the guise of survey bubble to see whether it's appropriate. We're all getting along. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. What well, is your first witness? Uh, we call Greg Jones. And for your honor's ease of reference, the exhibits that he'll be referring to are in a binder that's called Cart. <coughs> Current employer? Cardinal. And what is your current title or position? I am a technical director, vice president of uh, uh, resources, groundwater, and water supply. Are you a registered professional geologist in the state of Florida? Yes, I am. And what are your current responsibilities and duties? I oversee uh, a staff of about uh, 16 hydrogeologists that do various uh, groundwater projects around the state and various areas of the country. Uh, everything from uh, deep well construction, offer storage and recovery, water supply, uh, planning, groundwater modeling investigations, anything at all to, to deal with groundwater. And could you please describe your role in the Sable Trail Pipeline Project? I am the uh, project manager of my staff at Cardno that have been uh, uh, characterizing the karst features along the road through the Sable Trail Pipeline for the past uh, year and a half. Um, and I have worked on the team of consultants and Sable Trail staff, uh, karst experts working on those same issues. Do you have experience working on construction projects with respect to characterizing karst terrain? Yes, I do. And can you generally summarize your experience? 
for the past year I've been working on the, uh, the Sable Trail project, but prior to that when I was at the Southwest Florida Water Management District, I oversaw the program that provided cooperative funding to various utilities and water supply authorities uh, for them to build major infrastructure projects in karst terrain from very large reservoirs to 84 inch diameter water pipelines, transmission pipelines. And it was my responsibility to keep track of those projects and result on the status to our governing board. So I was very aware of any issues they were running into as they built those projects in Cars Terrain. If you turn down to tab 15 of your binder, do you have a binder? Which is Sable Trail Exhibit 15, which has already been entered into evidence. Is that a current and accurate copy of your resume? Yes, it is. Can you please summarize your higher education? I have a, a bachelor's degree, bachelor of science degree from Florida Atlantic University in geology, a master's of science degree from University of South Florida in hydrogeology, and um, if I pass my dissertation defense tomorrow, I'll have a PhD in hydrogeology and uh, groundwater chemistry. And very briefly, can you summarize your experience working on karst issues? My, um, my experience with CARS started at the University of South Florida in my, during my master's program. We had a very strong CARS program. Uh, following that, I uh, began my employment with the Southwest Florida Water Management District, and I was um, put in charge of a team of hydrogeologists to conduct multi-year comprehensive studies of all of the water management district's first magnitude spring systems, and that went from about 1993 to 1998 and we produce comprehensive reports on those investigations that are still used today at other water management districts and the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, after that, um, I was, because of that experience, I was invited to participate on Governor Jeb Bush's Florida Springs Task Force from 1999 through 2001 with other Karst and Springs experts to formulate strategies for protection and restoration of springs. And, um, during that entire time, I have spent a great deal of time in this area on various Southeastern Geological Society field trips for my own recreation, also scuba diving in the springs and the caverns. Um, I have done a lot of backpacking along the Florida Trail along the Swanee River, the entire 50-mile section along there. So I've, I've, I'm very familiar with the geology, hydrogeology of this region. In 2009, I was hired, when I worked at Cardinal, I was hired by the Swanee River Water Management District to determine if there were declines in spring flow and if there were what the causes were and to predict how groundwater withdrawal in the future would impact spring flow in their district. And I was also prior to that invited by the Swanee River Water Management District to advise them on uh, their springs research and um, spent a considerable amount of time coming up here at their invitation to, to tour their, their springs and the issues that were presented. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to offer Mr. Jones, hopefully soon to be Dr. Jones, as an expert in geology and hydrogeology. Any objection? Uh, I have one question for Mr. Jones with regard to his resume. Sir, when you resume, were, it reads a uh, project manager multiple places, that is not a reference to uh, being a certified project manager, is that correct? I'm not a certified project manager, no. And I have no objection to it. Mr. Jones Are you familiar with the general land requirements and construction techniques for the constructing a pipeline, the yes. disabled trail pipeline? Yes, I am. Can you please describe how you're familiar with the general land requirements and construction techniques for this project? From my uh, over year and a half experience working on uh, car issues associated with the pipeline. Are you familiar with the proposed route of the pipeline? Yes. Was LIDAR data used in evaluating karst issues along the route? Yes, it was, along the entire route from the Georgia border down to probably Sumter County. Was LIDAR data used for evaluating the approaches to the river crossings where HDD is proposed? Yes, it was. Does that include the areas that have been proposed for reroutes? Yes. And how was it used? We used it to, um, as a screening tool to determine the elevations, accurate elevations of, along the approaches of the uh, horizontal directional drill. Um, and from that information, we were able to determine where there were significant karst features, sinkhole features in that vicinity. 
Now, over the last several days, we've heard a lot about CARS features and different types of CARS features, some from experts, some from, from laypersons. But referring to uh, what's been entered into exhibit evidence as Sable Trail Exhibit 16, which is tab 16, and also the oversized demonstrative exhibit to your left, can you generally describe uh, for the court uh, how water moves through a karst geology and identify the various types of karst features? Yes. Can I approach the yes. poster? This is a block diagram that is representative of the karst flow system in the vicinity of the Sable Trail pipeline. A um, number of features that I want to point out, they're very important, everything we're talking about. First of all, this, this can be thought of as the Swanee River. There's a spring that discharges into the river. This is the Florida Aquifer Flow System composed of limestone. You can see that there are caverns in the Florida Aquifer, as well as just the, the basic uncavernous uh, limestone. These red arrows show the direction of groundwater flow from higher elevations down towards the river. Um, notice that we have this portion of the limestone that's blue. That is the saturated portion of the limestone. Above that is unsaturated limestone with no water in it. And above that, there is a thin layer of sand that, as you approach the river, it's very thin. The limestone is exposed at the surface. And the further away you get, the sand may be as much as 50 feet thick. Um, notice that there is a sinkhole feature that leads directly to a uh, cavern. And this is what's called a karst window. A karst window is nothing more than a sinkhole that is open to the aquifer. You can look, look into the sinkhole and see the crystal clear blue water of the aquifer, the same thing you see discharging from the springs. And, and you can see water going into the, into the karst window and going into the flow system. The thing to remember, though, is, is these features are relatively rare as sinkholes. Most of the sinkhole features are relatively small, they're full of sediment, they're inactive. The other thing to remember is they're everywhere. One of the one of the most fundamental aspects of this region is internal drainage. When it rains, the water seeps through the soil into the limestone and is entrained in the groundwater flow system. There's very little surface runoff. And we call this type of a system unconfined. The Florida aquifer here is unconfined. If, if between the limestone and the sand there was a thin clay layer that was breached by sinkholes, we would call that semi-confined, and it would allow uh, somewhat of a surface drainage system before everything drained into the aquifer. If there's a thick clay layer between the sand and the limestone, we call that confined. It's a confined condition. The water cannot get through the clay, so you have a, the typical well-developed surface water drainage system. Another very important point is that the Suwannee River is base level. All of the drainage, and let's think of this as about 15 miles from the upper portion of the flow system to the, the river. The river is the base of the flow system, the bottom of the flow system. Everything is entrained in the aquifer and moving towards the river, which is the bottom of the flow system. Everything is discharging into the river, either concentrated in a spring or as diffuse flow along the entire river. The entire river is a discharge area, and it is the bottom. Nothing goes below the, the river. Can you discuss how uh, the flow system develops as you get closer uh, to the vicinity of a spring? Right. When you're, when you're at the spring, the conduit system is very well developed. The conduits can be large enough for divers to swim through. Um, the further you go back into the, uh, the, uh, the further from the river you go, the less and less developed the karst conduits become until they eventually pinch out, and all of the flow is through the grain to grain contacts of the limestone. And as a result, we have different types of flow in the aquifer. Water that would enter a sinkhole right in through this karst window and get into the conduits could be at the spring in a matter of days. Water that seeps into the aquifer and is entrained in the flow system and moves through the grain to grain contacts could take 20 or more years to reach the spring. Water that's moving through those grain to grain contacts but may eventually intersect a conduit. It may take it 10 years to get to a conduit, but once it gets to the conduit, it can get to the spring in a matter of days. A conduit's more dominant near the spring or at the end of this or at the top of the spring shadow? Conduit flow 
is much more dominant at the spring itself. That's where the where the conduits are large enough for divers possibly to swim swim into the spring. But farther up, away from the river, they get smaller and smaller until they're gone. I just used a term of art, and I apologize. What's a spring shed? A spring shed is the area uh, where any rain that falls will eventually enter the flow system and discharge at a discrete spring. That's the same as a watershed. It is the it is where the water for a spring comes from up in the recharge area, spring shed. Thank you. Not a professor yet, so you can you don't have to stand all the time. As part of the ERP application, did you evaluate surface hydrology for the area affected by the project? Yes, I did. And that, was that summarized in a report that you prepared? Yes. And is that report the report that's depicted in tab 17? which is Sable Trail, Exhibit 17, which has already been entered into evidence? Yes, it is. And did you take into consideration, did you, cons did you use geophysical information as part of that evaluation? We didn't, we didn't particularly use uh, geophysical information as, in this report. We certainly did in the parks mitigation plan, but in this report we didn't use Geophysics. This was done prior to geophysics being deployed along the pipeline. But it was used in consideration with the mitigation plan? Yes, it was. And can you uh, explain from your report how you evaluated surface hydrology for the area affected by the project? Well, we spent a lot of time um, researching the groundwater flow system, the locations of the rivers, the locations of the springs, locations of the cave systems and karst windows, and how water moves through the area. We used what are known as potentiometric surface maps to to map spring sheds and what a potentiometric surface map is, it simply tells you the elevation of water in the groundwater flow system above sea level. So we did a lot of our own work to map the karst features along the pipeline, um, map the cave systems, map the sinkholes, map the karst windows, fracture traces. We also relied on a lot of existing reports, some of the premier reports uh, such as Upchurch's study on the Cody scarf and the nitrate studies for the Ishtakani Basin. And you just mentioned the Cody Scarp. So if you turn to tab 18, which is Sable Trail Exhibit 18, which has already been entered into evidence and also is blown up on that demonstrative exhibit to your left, can you explain the significance of the Cody Scarp? Yeah. Yes, sir. This, this green area that you see here is the Cody Scarp. And what that is is a retreating karst scarp. So to back up a little bit, it is the transition zone between where the Florida aquifer is confined, we talked about confinement in the last diagram, where there's a clay layer between the limestones and the uh, overlying sand, and where that clay layer is being eroded away so you get to where the Florida aquifer is unconfined, there is no clay. So it's a transition from confinement to unconfinement essentially, and it's anywhere from 15 to 20 miles thick, and it's an elevation change of maybe 100 feet, so they call it a scarf, even though you would never know that by driving up, it's not much of a scarf. You can see where the pipeline crosses the Cody Scarp, and you can see that the HDD crossing for the Suwannee River is in the, in the middle of the, of the uh, scarf right there. Now, as rivers from the north flow to the south, uh, from the northeast to, to, to the south, and from the north to south over here, as they approach the Cody Scarp, the confinement gets thinner and thinner, and the rivers then drop through that confinement into the limestone, and then they very aggressively dissolve the limestone. So there's many, many sinkholes here throughout the Cody, the Cody Scarp, an area of very active sinkhole development. Every river, with the exception of the Suwannee and the Wipakuchi, when it hits the Cody Scarp, drops into the aquifer, goes underground for some distance, and then pops out at the unconfined portion of the aquifer. And, um, uh, the Santa Fe River is a very large river that does that. It goes underground here and pops back out a few miles down, down gradient in the unconfined portion. What you notice is, is in the confined portion of the aquifer north east of the Cody Scarp, all of these red features that you see are karst features. They're essentially depressions. They're essentially sinkholes. And you see very few of them up here where the aquifer is, is confined. But when you get down here, you see that they're everywhere. There are millions of them, literally. <coughs> millions of them. And you've heard people come here and talk about, I have a sinkhole on my property. Absolutely, they have a sinkhole on the property. Everyone has a sinkhole on the property up here. 
They may not see it because it's buried, but they are everywhere. And what's going on here is the entire coastal lowland plain will eventually erode down to sea level. Now, it'll take millions of years, but it is eroding down to sea level. And it's a good thing that it's going to take millions of years because the erosion is very slow. And, and what that, the significance of that is we're not having catastrophic collapses of the karst. We're having, for the most part, slow dissolution of the limestone that results in more or less small sinkholes. And, um, and so, you know, if you step back and you look at this area, you might say, gosh, that's an incredibly unstable area, and why would anyone want to be here? But what's so important to understand about this area is nothing is done differently here than anywhere else in the state of Florida. We still have all the major infrastructure, including Interstate 75 going across the Cody Scarp. We have Interstate 10 following the Cody Scarp for probably seven miles. These interstates are loaded by 40-ton semi-trucks, thousands of them every day, with their vibration, with their petroleum products hitting the road, washing off into sinkholes. We have towns, we have Lake City, we have Live Oak right in the middle of the Cody Scarf. And remember, this is the area that supposedly is most sensitive. And we have railroads that are conveying 130-ton locomotives that carry 50 cars of hazardous waste. And yet, the significance of all of that is we do not hear about catastrophic collapses of any of these features on the interstates, on the railroads, in the towns. Yes, we have sinkholes. Sinkholes are everywhere. They're opening up, but they're not catastrophic collapses that cause us serious problems. And if this region can deal with major interstate highways, and think about the Think about the construction of these interstates, the footprint of construction, how wide these were, how it probably took over a year to build them, how they pounded in uh, pilings at the exits into the limestone. Um, contrast that to the gas pipeline, which will be a much smaller footprint, which will be a trench five feet deep, weeks of construction as opposed to years. The interstates, they brought in tremendous thicknesses of road base, asphalt, and, and again, much more invasive than anything that the pipeline would, would involve. Bottom line is, these areas are much more resilient than we give them credit for, and if they can deal with these types of infrastructures that are so invasive and so large, transported on daily, loading, unloading, vibrations, and we don't see these catastrophic collapses, this is why I'm comfortable with the pipeline being built in this area. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Jones. Are there any proposed HDD river crossings within the Cody Scarp? Yes, here's the Swanee Crossing. And that's the only one. Based off your testimony, you just identified the Cody Scarp as an area of sense of concern and to pay attention to it. As part of the work you did in, in your car's characterization report, which was, which was uh, Exhibit 17, How far out from the right-of-way did you conduct surveys to identify car's features? Regarding sinkholes, about half a mile uh, with the pipeline at the center, so a quarter mile on either side. Uh, cave systems and springs, uh, we were asked by the department to investigate those features within one mile of the pipeline, but for springs we went quite a bit further and, and tried to evaluate all of the, and we did evaluate all of the first magnitude and large second magnitude springs in the region. And so you identify first and second magnitude springs. I can start that and ask you a leading question. When the pipeline crossed a major spring shed, did you identify those springs associated with it? Yes, we did. And how far out were some of those springs? Some were up to 18 miles. And you identified those springs? Yes. And can you explain <coughs> why you selected these distances? Well, again, we thought it important to show if, if, a, if the pipeline proposed route actually crossed the spring shed, we wanted to show where that spring was in relation to the pipeline. And we mapped the distance from the closest approach of the pipeline to the actual spring itself. And, um, and the significance of that was, as I pointed out earlier in my exhibit, we thought it was important for the pipeline not to be near the spring vent itself because that's where the conduit flow is and that's where the spring is most sensitive. So the farther away the pipeline is from the major springs, 
the less impact they would be. Because as I said, the conduit system gets uh, gets thinned out the further away from the spring you get. There's, and you've been here the whole time for this hearing, correct? Yes, I have. And there's been some testimony before, about, and anecdotal testimony about potential impacts on caves. Uh, do you have an opinion as to whether the pipeline will have an impact on caves? The the only place where caves are crossed is the foul mouth cave system. Um, to my knowledge, that's the only place where the pipeline crosses the cave. And the pipeline will be at that location. The pipeline will be buried at a depth of four to six feet. Uh, again, the, uh, it will not be in the aquifer. It will not be in the limestone. And I do not believe there will be any impacts on the pipeline as a result of that. Um, on the cave system as a result of the construction of the pipeline there. Do you have an opinion as to whether the HDD river crossings will have an adverse effect on nearby springs? I don't believe, I think there is, there is one spring that is a fourth magnitude spring, a fourth magnitude spring is a spring that discharges less than um, 650,000 gallons per day. It's, it's one of the smaller springs uh, in the classification of springs. And as you do this explanation, I'm just go ahead and get this teed up. Look at the Sable Trail Exhibit 19 and Exhibit 20, which have already been entered into evidence. Exhibit 19, it's already blown up there. Using these exhibits, uh, let's specifically talk about, we've been talking about two rivers today, the Suwannee and the Santa Fe. So let's talk about the Suwannee River first. Uh, there's a lot going on here, so let me orient you to it. Here's the Suwannee River moving through the region. And remember, the Suwannee River is the base of the flow system. Everything is moving down through that valley, through the Suwannee Valley, to the river itself. All the groundwater discharges at the base of that system. The area that you see here... So before you do that, so can you explain what the yellow and orange lines mean in reference right. to the Suwannee being at the bottom of the flow system? The yellow lines are called potentiometric surface contours, which, which essentially mark the elevation of the groundwater in the flow system above sea level. So for example, this contour is labeled 45 feet, this contour is labeled 40. So the, you can see you're moving down gradient in the flow system. Groundwater is moving down. <coughs> On the side of the map, here's 45 feet, here's 40. Off the map would be 50, 55, so groundwater is moving down. And then we have drawn in flow lines to show where groundwater is moving throughout the region. You can see that everything, all the flow lines converge on the Suwannee River, meaning that the flow system, all the groundwater in the flow system is moving to discharge at the Suwannee River. Now, um, again, within this circle, that's a one mile radius from where the pipeline crosses the river. We were asked by the department to map all springs within a one mile radius and there are four of them. There is one that is about 1,100 feet downriver from the pipeline, a fourth magnitude on Name Spring. About uh, three quarters of a mile, there are two additional springs, Three Sisters, which uh, the magnitude is not known. Number three is Stevenson Spring, a second magnitude, and then a fourth magnitude spring, or third magnitude spring, about a mile away. Those are the only springs. The um, the significance of that is, remember I said that groundwater is discharging along the entire river. In some places it's very concentrated, in other places it's diffuse, it's not concentrated. In this area, because there are so few small springs, especially at the crossing, it is not an area of concentrated groundwater discharge. And for that reason, I don't believe that there is a well-developed conduit system there. Now, if, it was, if this was a first magnitude spring, and water was discharging there and the pipeline was going by the first magnitude spring, that would be an area of concentrated groundwater discharge where we would, uh, we would know there would be significant conduit flow in that region, but it isn't. And also, we mapped with LIDAR the approaches to the spring, and although there are some sinkhole features, as I've said, sinkholes are everywhere, um, this was the best route in the vicinity where we found the least karst features sinkholes on the approaches. And that's what we would expect. It's not an area of concentrated groundwater discharge. It's not likely that there's going to be a lot of dissolution and a lot of sinkholes along that route. And along, can you now, I think if you flipped 
to the next uh, demonstrative exhibit, which is Save Bow, which is a blow up of Save Bow Exhibit 20. Let me, let me clarify and answer. Uh, Mr. Jones, uh, you, were, you were involved in the, in the selection, the root selection, or just in its analysis? So the root, the, I was involved in the in the movement of the route from the Wittapuchi Crossing. I was involved in the evaluation of the route from the Wittapuchi Crossing to the Swanee River Crossing. And this, this issue of the magnitude of the uh, springs along a prospective route was the criterion that you were using? Yes. That's why. And can you explain what we have here with the Santa Fe HDD crossing analysis? Very similar to the Swanee Crossing here, you see the, the tensiometric surface contours, 50, 40, 30, 20, indicating the level of groundwater in the Florida and Aquifer. Uh, same situation, Santa Fe River is base level. The flow, everything in the flow system, all groundwater is moving down gradient to discharge at the, at the river. You can see the lines of groundwater flow moving towards the river. This is where the pipeline, the, the HDD crossing will be under the river. And see uh, that there are five springs. These are all third and fourth magnitude springs. The closest is 2,000 feet up, up river, up gradient from the crossing. Again, not an area of concentrated groundwater flow. Not, and, and we use LIDAR to map the approaches. And again, we didn't see a lot of development of karst features. That doesn't mean there are none. As I said, sinkholes are everywhere, but there are not large, major, active sinkholes on the approaches. And I apologize to make you go back, but if you could just go back to Exhibit 19 specifically, there, we've had specific testimony about the Stevenson Spring. Is the Stevenson Spring up gradient or down gradient from the proposed crossing location? It is up gradient in the flow system, meaning that groundwater is, is moving down this way from the springs down towards the pipeline crossing, and it is also upstream of the crossing. Thank you. You can have a seat. You can. You just mentioned that the, there was a reroute. Uh, you were involved in the selection of the reroute for the, from the Wicklacoochee River. There's been anecdotal testimony earlier about whether there's a difference between the uh, original route and the reroute. Do you have an opinion as to whether there are differences between the two proposed crossings? Yes, the, uh, I, I visited that site the, with the Coochie Crossing on two different occasions. There were many uh, active sinkholes. There, were, um, there was clear evidence of spring discharge all through the region. There were mapped cave systems. Um, there were karst windows. Again, sinkhole features open to the aquifer itself. And um, during the geophysical testing and boring along the Sable Trail route by Sable Trail, transmission. Um, the geology was found to be very karstic underneath, and for all these reasons it was not an ideal location for the pipeline to go through. And can you just briefly describe some of the distinguishing characteristics with the current proposed location from that location, from the yeah. original location? Right. As I said before with the Swanee Crossing, it was not an area of concentrated groundwater discharge. There were no closest spring was a small one, 1,100 feet downstream, with other springs, uh, the closest being three quarters of a mile away, up gradient in the flow system and up the river. Um, there, were, there was not a lot of, uh, there certainly was not a lot of active karst features, sinkholes, uh, karst windows, features that were currently uh, clearly <coughs> conveying water. There were uh, there are no mapped cave systems right at the crossing. The closest is Stevenson Spring, which is some distance away from the crossing. So a, a very different situation. Earlier you mentioned the karst mitigation plan and a fair amount of testimony concerning that plan. And just in case you need to reference it, it's tab 21 or Sable Trail Exhibit 21, which has already been admitted into evidence. What's the purpose of a mitigation plan? Well, the, the purpose of the plan in this case was to mitigate the potential uh, impacts of the pipeline regarding karst features, such as uh, uh, 
sinkholes opening up during construction. Let me, let me say there's a two main aspects where sinkholes opening up during construction along the pipeline. And the second was the horizontal directional drill under the rivers. Those were the areas where it was thought that there would be the most impacts. Those are the kinds of impacts that, that we thought would happen. And you were one of the authors for the mitigation plans, correct? I was, I was the editor. I pulled everything together. I, I worked with the team, and there were quite a few people involved in it. As I said, the karst experts, the consultants, and say the drill staff. I pulled all that information together. I wrote some of it. I edited it all and put it into a coherent document. Right. You said team. <coughs> Just briefly describe who was involved. You want names? And what they did in their profession. Um, Ian Kinnear with uh, uh, PSI, who is a uh, uh, hydrogeologist, uh, uh, and I, I don't, I can't remember, you know, geotechnical engineer, hydrogeologist. I can't remember specifically what their qualifications were. But is Ian an engineer? Uh, he's either a geotechnical geologist or, or a geotechnical engineer. I'm not certain. Well. And who else was involved? Um, a number of staff uh, from Sable Trail. Um, a number of the of the pipeline um, staff for Sable Trail um, and from the consultants, uh, probably about a total of 15 staff. Earlier, there's been some anecdotal te uh, testimony about dye trace studies uh, in the area. One of the contingencies that the mitigation plan deals with is, is if there was a release of, of drilling mud into the aquifer. Does the, can you opine as to whether a dye trace study that shows a hydrologic connection between two points uh, uh, is applicable to, uh, directly applicable to understanding the movement of drilling mud in the aquifer? You no, know, all a dye trace does is, in the case, let's use the foul mouth trace, for example, there's a karst window. Uh, foul mouth is a it's called a spring, but it's not a spring, it's a karst window. Water comes up at the bottom of this sinkhole and it flows for about 450 feet and then it goes down. And they put a dye in this, in this karst window and then they saw that it came out some distance uh, down gradient on the Swanee River, which is exactly what anyone would expect to happen. Um, any competent hydrogeologist could look at where that spring is and look at a potentiometric surface map um, that shows the elevation of the groundwater, and within half an hour they could work out that the water going through that karst window was going to come out of those springs on the Swanee River. Um, you could even work out the velocities, but the nice thing about the velocity of the dye, how long it would take to go from the karst window to the river, um, the nice thing about a dye trace is it definitively tells you how fast that water is going to go, and it definitively tells you that yes, it will come out of these springs that you predicted that it would come out to just from the data that you could do from the desktop study. Um, it really doesn't, it, it doesn't give you any information at all about where drilling fluid would migrate because remember, the pipeline, the HDD is at the bottom of the flow system, it's the base of the flow system, that drilling mud is not going anywhere other than the bottom of the river. It, it could, worst case scenario, the drilling mud could be forced out of the borehole under pressure and it could migrate a short distance, but then it's no longer under pressure, it's heavier than water, it's 95% water, the rest is bent on clay, heavier than water, but it would settle out, it would settle out rather rapidly uh, before it could go very far. It's not going to, it can't migrate up gradient, that's against the laws of physics, it can't migrate up gradient to people's wells, um, it can't migrate great distances to springs, especially if they're up gradient, it can't go across spring shed divides, it's going up against the force of gravity and the flow and the flow system. It's going to stay relatively close to the horizontal directional drill. And I think there's been some confusion about grouting and drilling mud today. What exactly is drilling mud? Uh, sodium montmorillonite is a bentonite clay. As one of the previous witnesses testified, it's, it's volcanic ash that's mined in um, Wyoming. It's, it is nothing more than a clay. Um, it is used all of the time in water wells. It's used in major production wells that supply thousands of people. Um, they use it to keep the hole open until they get into competent rock. And when they finish with the well, they, they 
they do what's called development. They pump it all out, and then people drink the water. It's as simple as that. It's not a. It's not considered to be a harmful chemical. It's used all through this region under certain situations for drilling water wells. I mean, do you have an opinion as to whether the construction activities will have an effect on water supply wells? We mapped all the water supply wells along the pipeline route um, and found, I believe, only one in 2,000 feet of the crossing, of the HDB crossing. I don't believe, again, for the vast majority of the pipeline route, it's only going to be buried at, say, four to six feet. It's not going to be in the aquifer. It's not going to be any drilling mud or grout or anything associated with it. Take a hole, put the pipe in, and cover it back up. I don't think in that situation there will be any impacts to any water wells. Um, now, the one place where it's going to go under limestone, which will be bored through the limestone, is at the HDD crossings, two places. And uh, there are, at the Swanee crossing, there are no water wells anywhere near the Pennsylvania State Park. I believe there are a few within 2,000 feet at the Santa Fe crossing. Um, there is a slight chance that um, drilling, the drilling fluid could reach one of those wells. But again, it isn't, if someone drank the water, it would not poison them. Um, they might need a laxative after they drank that, but uh, that's about as bad as it would get. Um, and Sable Trail has, in two different reports that I'm aware of, stated that they will provide water to anyone, anyone whose well either the, uh, the flow or the quality is diminished, and if it's diminished permanently, they will replace the well. Do you think there's a substantial likelihood that there will be an effect on wells? I don't think there will be a substantial likelihood. From your perspective as a hydrogeologist, well, we've had testimony uh, about whether the construction of the pipeline may have effect on um, uh, specifically MFLs. Do you have an opinion as to whether MFLs will be affected? Uh, the FERC asked us to research that in depth and um, at the they were most concerned at the river crossings that there would be some impact to minimum flows and levels. And at the Swanee, uh, the minimum flow and level has not yet been established for that portion of the Swanee where the pipeline will cross. Um, and so it's not possible to tell what that, what that, what their minimum flow is going to be. However, I think there is no chance that there will be any significant decline in flow that could affect the minimum flow that will eventually be adopted. I think it's supposed to be adopted in 2016 this one. Now, I'm sorry. Yeah, go, keep up. For the uh, for the Santa Fe, um, the minimum flow has already been exceeded from groundwater pumping. Groundwater pumping has reduced the flow in Santa Fe uh, by a considerable amount. Again, groundwater pumping has pulled water down from the river because it's a karst area. So the more pumping, the more water drains down out of the river into the aquifer. Um, the minimum flow has been exceeded. However, the pipeline crossing there will do nothing to, to decrease the discharge any further into the river. Again, it is the bottom of the Suwannee, the Santa Fe, or the bottom of the flow system. All the water is going down there, and HDD cannot block the flow because it's at the bottom of the flow system. The flow is already there. And there's been testimony about whether construction of the pipeline may have effect on, on regional groundwater flow. Do you have an opinion as to whether this project will affect regional groundwater flow? The, the only impacts that I can see from the pipeline, again, um, it's only going to be buried four to six feet when it goes under roads. and the jack and board under roads, it may be down to eight to 12 feet. Uh, very unlikely that it's going to be in the limestone, um, but it's, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. I asked me a question again, if you would. There's been testimony about whether the pipeline may adversely affect regional ground right, flows. Right, where I was going with that was the most likely occurrence would be sinkhole collapse <clears throat> along, sinkhole formation collapse along the pipeline route during the construction phase. And there is some chance that that material would block some some flow in, this, in, the, in the groundwater flow system. But think of a first magnitude spring. The the spring shed can be hundreds and hundreds of square miles. The water coming to the spring is coming from hundreds of square miles. If a sinkhole should 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 close off um, a conduit 
you might find a change in the flow system locally, but only locally. And, and the, because the aquifer is, think of it as Swiss cheese, cracked everywhere, that water would hit the obstruction and then find a way around. It would simply find other channels to go, away, go around. You may disrupt the flow temporarily locally. It would have no, would have no impact at all on regional flow or regional discharge at a spring. It, what do you mean by locally? Is it at the pipe itself? Within within the immediate vicinity of the of the sinkhole itself, which even again when I say a spring shed made six hundred square miles, you're talking about an area of of an acre or two. And you based on the evaluations you've done and the material you reviewed and your experience in your opinion, have reasonable assurances been provided that the project will not adversely affect regional flows? Yes. And what is the basis for your opinion? What I just went through. I, I, the, the only impacts along the pipeline route would be sinkhole collapse, which could affect the flow system only locally. These recharge areas are huge. The pipeline is only going to, the footprint of the pipeline is only going to cover a very small portion of that. There is some potential for sinkhole formation, um, but again, we think it would be minor. We think the impact of the flow system would be very minor, it would be local. Water could get around, water will get around. It doesn't a collapse into the aquifer, will not act as a dam. Water will move around it through other channels in the limestone. And as part of developing the mitigation plan, did the team that you worked on take into consideration geotechnical information? Yes. Hey, what exactly is geotechnical information? Geotechnical would be uh, borings, actual, actually drilling into the subsurface, drilling into the limestone. And did you take into consideration geophysical information? Yes. And what is geophysical information? The two methods, the two geophysical methods, the ground penetrating radar and electrical resistivity studies. Ground penetrating radar is is simply putting um, radar waves into the subsurface and the reflections that you get back tell you something about the, the competency of the layers, the subsurface layers. Uh, and and if, there's a, if there's a shallow sinkhole that's not covered by clay, you can see the rattling, you can see the, the even if it's full of sediment, you can see the shape of the sinkhole in the subsurface. Electrical resistivity is where you inject, you're essentially putting electricity and generating electric field in the subsurface and again, the returns from that give you information on the, uh, the subsurface layers and their resistivity and their, are they filled with water, are there voids down there, those kinds of things. So, did so as part of the application process addressing parse features, both the surface and the subsurface were evaluated? Yes. Now, turning to uh, there we go. Sable Trail Exhibit 22, which is tab 22, which is blown up to your left. Does the pipeline cross any major spring sheds? Yes, it does. Does it cross to the act close to the actual spring? The closest approach is to Madison Loop Spring, about 1.7 miles. Um, the approaches to the other springs where the spring ship has been mapped is considerably further. <coughs> Did Sable Drill intentionally try to avoid crossing near springs? In some cases, a lot of the route follows existing utility corridors. And uh, it worked out such that the corridors were not near the major springs. The Wikipedia um, crossing is one example where they avoided it after it was made clear that that was not a, a good place to cross. And we've had testimony for the last several days about the magnitude of the springs. Is that a specific term? Does it have meaning? Yes, first magnitude spring. Uh, the discharge the, the discharge has to be on average greater than 65 million gallons per day. Second magnitude spring, the discharge has to be 
has to average 6.5 to 65 million gallons per day, a third magnitude, 650,000 to 6.5 million gallons per day, and a fourth magnitude below 650,000 gallons. And that is on average. One, one of the problems with a lot of the identification of springs in this area is there are very few measurements. And you can't really classify the magnitude of a spring based on a few measurements. You have to do it for years, you have to do it during different seasons, because during the wet season it can be flowing like gangbusters. In the dry season, it can be nearly below that. In towards the end here. Do you have an opinion as to whether the construction activities for the pipeline will seal off karst features, preventing the flow of groundwater to springs? That's that's a, a lot of what the answer to that is covered in what I said earlier. There is some possibility that that uh, sinkhole collapse during pipeline construction could um, block some flow locally. It, we don't believe that it will have a an impact on regional flow, and that again the water can go around these features, and so. Uh, the worst case scenario is a temporary blockage until the flow system locally sorts itself out. And in your opinion, will the HDD activities have an adverse effect on spring flow? Uh, again, according to that exhibit that we looked at earlier, at the Swanee Crossing, there is one spring that is 1,100 feet down gradient and down the river. That is, there is a slight possibility that some of the flow, or possibly even drilling fluid, could reach that spring. Some of the flow could be could be diverted. Drilling fluid could possibly reach that spring. Um, out of an abundance of caution, I'll say there is a very slight chance that could happen. Um, and the springs up gradient, the three springs up gradient within a mile. I don't believe they will be impacted because they are up gradient and because they are so far away. A smaller chance that those would be impacted. And again, those springs. Um, further away, any spring further away or in another spring shed, we could go over a groundwater divide to get to that spring shed. It simply would not be possible for those to be impacted because water does not flow up there. And have you reviewed the draft environmental impact study prepared by FERC? Yes, I have. And are the findings of the DIS concerning uh, the cars consistent with the testimony you've provided today? If anything, they were even more definitive than the, than the conclusions that we reached. You mentioned that there one on the Swanee River. There's one spring down rate that may be affected, that fourth order spring. Do you think there's a stand, substantial likelihood that that spring will be affected by the HDD crossing? Not a substantial likelihood. No. Thank you. No further questions, John. No questions from the board. on the, all the databases that we looked at to try to identify where cave systems exist. The only place we know of where the pipeline crosses the cave system is right here. And this is the foul mouth cave system.
continue? And, and where will the pipeline go? I, I mean, vertically, I mean, not just. The pipeline will, when it crosses here, it will be buried no greater than, say, four to six feet deep. It will be well above the ground <coughs> system. It will be above the water table, most likely. And uh, it will be nowhere near the cave itself. It will be much higher than the depth of the cave. And do you know what the depth of the cave is? No, I don't specifically, but I would guess. Um, usually these caves are in the upper part of the limestone, so I would guess it would be no closer to the surface than, say, 100, 100 feet or so, especially at that, in, in that location. And is there any possibility that that pipeline could indeed, if a pipeline were to puncture a system such as that one, how would that be remedied? Okay, Objection, that's asking for an hypothetical. You just explain what he thought the distance was between them. Do you believe that it's impossible? Okay. It is impossible. Objection, that calls for speculation. Impossible. In his experience. So let's get clear, your question is whether it's possible a pipeline that has a 95 foot difference between uh, a no cave. Did he say it was a 95 foot difference? Well, I think he said that it was, no closer the way. trenching was at 5 feet and then the depth was 100 feet. Alright, let's move on. And if you did, if a cavern or an opening below the surface was, the pipeline did come into contact with that, what would be done to Objection calls for a hypothetical. I'm pretty sure it's included in the curse mitigation plan. Well, then, if you point to the plan, it was a provision related to this project. Do you know the answer? I have an objection to that. Does the curse mitigation plan address um, any kind of uh, interception of ca caverns? Keep in mind that a cavern is nothing more than a conduit that we know is there. It's exactly the same thing. The pipeline will cross many caverns, many conduits. And as I showed you in that block diagram, those conduits are everywhere. They go up into the flow system. The further up they go, the smaller they get. Those conduits are everywhere. What leads me to believe that there is little to no chance of the pipeline impacting a conduit system is, again, the existing infrastructure. When you have interstate highways, when you have railroads that are transporting 130-ton locomotives and they're not crushing cave systems, the pipeline will certainly not crush a cave system or impact a cave system. And you acknowledge that roofs are on top of the surface, whereas this pipeline will be below the surface. The road is below the surface, but the, I mean, uh, on the surface, but the construction to build the road was definitely well below the surface. They had to do a lot of earth moving to bring in the road base, and it would have probably been the same depth as the pipeline, so I see no difference. And you were speaking of conduits. Um, there's a report that you have. It is it's written by yourself, and it is a good TK. I'm not sure if you heard anything. Um, 
these were prepared by myself and my staff. Could you please read the last paragraph on that page? Page one? I mean, page? Oh, I'm sorry, page two? TK2. Because the drilling fluid is injected under pressure during HDD, it could be forced up gradient through the active conduit in the aquifer to some degree. However, the conduits are not like fully sealed concrete pipes. They are interconnected channels that are fractured everywhere and completely open to exchange of water from the conduit into the surrounding aquifer and from the aquifer into the conduit. Therefore, if drilling fluid is forced under pressure up gradient through an active conduit under the river, it is likely to be forced out of the conduit and upward through the river bottom before it travels very far. That's, that's what I testified to previously. It, it is not going to travel very far from the actual HDD. And did you also say before that there was no water flow below the river? That's a complicated question. The, the flow system by far and away is, is what we would call the upper floor and aquifer is the base of it would be the river. Below that, there is water in the aquifer, the movement of that water, and, and there is not a lot of data on that in the Swanee River Water Management District. There is, there is probably a very little movement of that water. There is probably not a well-developed flow system at all, and it has nothing to do with the upper floor and aquifer that supplies the springs and the drinking water and all of that. So you are familiar that there are vents, and by vents I mean openings in the Swanee River, both below and on the banks. As I said, there is diffuse flow and conduit and spring flow everywhere along the Swanee River and the Santa Fe. It is the discharge point for the entire aquifer. Um, earlier, I said that you had been present at um, the Houston hearing on every day, and did you hear Mr. Edwards' testimony that you believe there were more than four springs listed at the location there? I did hear him say that. And would that surprise you? No. No. And I thought about what he said, and I believe there are springs there, just as there are car speakers again, just as there are sinkholes everywhere. Because water is discharging everywhere up and down the Suwannee River, absolutely there would be springs. Now, because I've never heard of them and they're not in any of the databases, I believe they're probably quite small. So it doesn't, does it change your opinion of whether that would be the best location for it to cross the river? Not at all. And again, from your testimony in this report, you acknowledge that there will be a certain amount of leakage into the river from drilling fluid. I, I do not acknowledge that. Therefore, if drilling fluid is forced under pressure of gradient through an active conduit under the river, it is likely to be forced out the conduit upward through the river bottom. The key word there is if. If it is, there is a there is a chance that water will or drilling fluid will come out of the borehole because the borehole is through a karst region under the river. It is, it is by no means certain that it will, but there is a possibility that it will. And how deep will the pipeline go below the river? Um, 60, 65 feet or so. Do you know what the drinking wells are, the depth of drinking wells in the area? Drinking water wells, there are no drinking water wells um, anywhere near the Swanee Crossing for the Salt State land. And, but so you don't know the depth of what the drinking water wells are? Actually, Your Honor, how can you know the depth if there aren't any? How about the ones in the Wicked Pitch? I mean, the Santa Fe Pitch. There are some drinking water wells. Um, I do not know the depth, but again, because the rivers are the bottom of the flow system, those those wells are at some distance, and I I don't believe they would be impacted by by drilling fluids. And again, if they were, I said before, there was a small chance that they could be. Drilling fluid is not a toxic <coughs> substance, and if a homeowner should notice that there is drilling fluid in their wells, Sable Trail has stated at least twice in documents that the um, they
they will provide drinking water, and if the well quality and quantity does not return to its pre um, the pre flow and quality, then they will replace the well. And there is all there are also provisions for testing of those wells prior to construction of the pipeline so they can get baseline water quality and then testing during the uh, construction of the pipeline as well. Okay. And uh, you spoke of fracture traces earlier. What are those? Fracture traces are the surface expression of, of uh, cracks in the limestone. They may be indicated by different, when you look at an aerial photo, you may see different tones in the soil. You may see aligned sinkholes. You may see vegetation patterns aligned. Um, you can look at those things and get an idea that there might be something there. But until you do geophysics, until you do borings, you don't know. And what are the impacts of fracture traces? I, I don't understand the question. Does the it, the rock more stable, less stable? Is there water flowing through that area? What, what impacts do If there is indeed a fracture in the limestone, it can do a number of things. It can be um, a preferential route for groundwater to move. It can affect the location of rivers in terms of rivers tend to follow the path of least resistance. And if they found the weak, they find the weakness in the limestone and they follow the river. That's why you see these straight, these straight segments in the river that suddenly turn you know, very sharply at 90 degrees and then turn back. They're following a, a fracture. Just as sinkhole features are everywhere, fractured, fractures, the rock is fractured everywhere as well. I don't believe there would be, I don't see how the locations of fractures, the presence of fractures, um, every fracture would be different in terms of how much of the line, how big it is, how much water it might convey. Um, I don't believe that there would, that, that would make a difference to the uh, directional drill. Catastrophic collapse would be similar to what's been seen in the Orlando area, which is a much more, um, it's an area that's much more unstable than this area. And the interesting thing about that is the city of Orlando is built on an area that's much more state, unstable than this area, where the aquifer is semi-defined. There is clay, and the fact that there is clay allows much larger sinkholes to open. They can get very large, and then the, suddenly the overlying material can collapse and you can get very large holes in the ground, and anything that's built on top of those will fall in. I'm not aware of, of those types of catastrophic sinkholes forming in this area. There are large sinkholes here, but again, I'm not aware of that type of catastrophic collapse that damage property or structures or railroads or interstate highways, and they're much less likely to occur here than they would in, in, in the Orlando area because of the geologic conditions. Well, the members of Walls Watershed Coalition have testified they have seen sinkholes open up. There is also a newspaper article of a man in O'Brien, is it, that fell in? The live oak. O'Brien that fell in a sinkhole. We have someone, a cow fell in a sinkhole. Um, so you, you say that you don't know of any catastrophic collapses. Those don't meet my definition of a catastrophic collapse by any means. Catastrophic collapse, let's, let's use an example. The Winter Park sinkhole that occurred in 1980, when it collapsed, an entire Olympic-sized swimming pool went into that feature, along with a car dealership. It was huge, and it, it went directly down to the aquifer um, 80 feet to the groundwater table. That's a catastrophic collapse where there's 
very significant property damage. I don't argue with you at all that there are sinkholes that open up. I thought I made that clear before. That's a common occurrence. It is what's happening in this area. Sinkholes are everywhere. They absolutely will open up. It's a matter of degree and how serious those sinkholes are. And what impact does that have on the pipeline if the sinkhole opened up? Again, from what I've seen in the geology of this area and the size of the sinkholes that do open up, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on how much of, you know, how, what the span of the pipe would be before it might be impacted by sinkholes, but we map the sinkhole features for the entire route in Florida, a quarter mile on either side of the pipeline, and we found almost 3,000 of them. But the vast majority are small, shallow, sediment-filled. They are not karst windows. They don't open to the aquifer. Um, and they are not loud, large enough to cause any impacts to the, the pipeline whatsoever.